I'll, I'll start by um, reading two minutes worth of something rather grim. Abdurrahman Jaloud, an activist in his 20s, was arrested on the very first day of rage. He was held in the capital's state security branch 251 and spent 53 days in solitary confinement. He was tortured every day. His first session began when an officer declared, I want to see blood on the walls. This triggered a beating with a nail-studded club. Other torments included being hung from his wrists for hours on end and being beaten while pushed inside a tire. Often he was woken by a bucket of cold water followed up by an electric shock. The beatings and shocks were concentrated on his left knee and left shoulder. Over three years later, he still suffers pain and stiffness in these joints. He believes his torturers were on captagon, an amphetamine-type drug very popular today amongst fighters on all sides. The worst torturer was called Abul Mot, or father of death, and this man was clearly enjoying himself. But Abdurrahman found the psychological torture of solitary the most difficult to deal with. He shivered in his underwear, these were the bitterly cold winter months, under a permanent strong light which broke his sleep. After a while, he says, you feel the torture is just your daily work. I used to spend an extra minute in the toilet so they'd punish me with torture. I wanted to be tortured to have a break from solitary. Later, he was transferred through a series of group cells. One was two meters by one, in which 13 people were crammed. Another was four meters by two and fitted 30 to 50. On Fridays, protest day, he was held in a six meters by four cell with up to 200 others. It was forbidden to speak and a Mukhabarat mole was always with them. They could tell who he was quite easily. He was the only one who was clean and healthy, he says. Who is clean and healthy in prison? <laughs> the usual food, always dirty, was boiled potatoes and bitter olives, two things he's unable to look at now. But one guard was kind. When the other guards were absent, he passed him small gifts, salt to gargle when his throat was infected, once a falafel sandwich. One day he was summoned to meet an officer. Genuinely interested, this man engaged him in a four-hour conversation on the causes of the protests. Abdurrahman learnt some of what was happening outside from their discussion. Later on, when there was a huge influx of new prisoners and continuous sounds of torture in the distance, he understood a revolution was underway. Finally, he was moved to Adra prison, where he met people from all over Syria, from every sect and ethnicity. The regime's biggest mistake was to bring us all together, he says. The prison was full, at least 11,000 people inside. Riyad Saif and George Sabra were there. So was Mish'al Timmu. Mish'al learnt news of outside from Kurdish guards and relayed it to us. He also organized us. So, for instance, I taught computer skills to those who didn't have them. We memorized each other's phone numbers. Abdurrahman was released in July. He immediately chased up his prison contacts and they began working. We blocked roads with fire and ran. When they shot at us, we decided to resist. We bought 300 slingshots and distributed them to the fastest runners. We spread information to revolutionaries in other areas, how to make and throw Molotovs, for example. Coming uh, to tonight's event, the launch of this phenomenal uh, new book, Burning Country. Uh, Robin and I are going to speak for come on in. Robin and I are going to speak for 20 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll open things up uh, with you guys for a Q&A for 40, 45 minutes or so, and then there's a reception uh, downstairs. Before all of that, uh, Robin's got another passage he's going to read. You can do it from the lectern, or you can do it from here if you like. Whatever, whatever is more uh, comfortable for you. Yep. Yeah. Pretend that you're not there. Um, I should also say hello to Leila, my co-author, who is released. Yes, hello to her. <coughs> um, a bit cheerier than the last bit. Many Syrians speak of their first protest as a moment of personal liberation. Uli, for instance, the engineering student from Hums. At first I was scared to join in, but one day there was a very big demonstration which came from two directions, from the old part and the new part of al -Wad. When I heard the chanting, the people want, and the singing, I started crying. Suddenly I was filled with courage, and I picked myself up and walked out to join in. My mother tried to stop me, but I went anyway. Beautiful experience. I felt at last I was participating in the effort to lift the oppression off us. Before that, I used to be scared to talk even in front of my friends. 
I even cheered for Bashar at the university during his first speech to the People's Assembly. Can you imagine? Something I regret very much now. And Yar and Nasser, a Christian from Damascus. There was such a positive atmosphere. It sounds incredible, but suddenly everyone had good ethics. People stood together. Their slogans were very beautiful. Remember, this is a people who'd been brainwashed and kept apart for decades. Victims of a failed education system, a failed social system. In this context, what the people did was amazing. I went to Medan to protest. It's a conservative Muslim neighborhood, and I was wearing a skimpy top. One young man asked me, politely enough, to dress more appropriately when I came next. But his friend said, no, sister, you wear whatever you like. Whatever you like, we're here for our freedom after all. We really were ready to transform into an open society. We had great momentum. Syrians were discovering themselves and their country anew. They were learning the names of towns and villages they'd never previously heard of. Places like Kefarendum, which produced banners, slogans, and cartoons each week. Seeing familiar places in fresh ways. Hunts, though it is ancient, Nessa, used to be a nondescript city beside an oil refinery and the butt of a thousand jokes. Now it was the capital of the revolution, a noble city to be praised and emulated. Competition and resentment between cities and regions was the old normality. Suddenly people in one chance, in one place, were chanting their solidarity with others. Oh, Hums, they sang, or Dera, or Benyas, or Dera Zor, with you until death. And Arabs learnt the Kurdish word for freedom, Azadi. In endless spiral protests met by gunfire, led to funerals, which led to larger protests, which led to more funerals. Everybody on the streets now called for revolution, not reform. Protesters were seen raising their right hands to swear to continue the struggle until the regime was toppled, no matter what befell them. By attending protests and speaking out, hundreds of thousands had burnt their bridges with a regime brooking no dissent. By principle and for reasons of survival, millions were committed to destruction by peaceful means if possible. What remained was to build an alternative. And then in the next chapter, which focuses on the alternative of extract, Omar Aziz, fondly known to friends as Abu Khamid, was born in Damascus. An economist, anarchist, husband and father, he returned from exile in 2011 at the age of 63 and committed himself to the revolution. Working with locals to distribute humanitarian, humanitarian aid to suburbs under regime attack, he was inspired by the diverse actions he came across, the various <laughs> forms of protest, as well as the solidarity and mutual aid within and between communities, including voluntary provision of emergency medical and legal support, turning homes into field hospitals, and food collection. He saw in such acts, quote, the spirit of the Syrian people's resistance to the brutality of the system, systematic killing and destruction of communities. Aziz believed that protests alone were insufficient to bring about a radical transformation. A new society had to be built from the bottom up to challenge authoritarian structures and transform value systems. He produ produced a paper in the revolution's eight The movement was still largely peaceful and before land was liberated, in which he advocated the establishment of local councils. These were envisaged as horizontally organized grassroots forums in which people could work together to achieve three primary goals manage their lives independently of the state, to collaborate collectively, and to initiate a social revolution locally, regionally, and nationally. He proposed that councils network to foster solidarity and mutual aid and to share experience. Aziz helped establish the first local council in Zabadani and then others in Barze, Daraya, and Duma. Omar Aziz didn't live to witness the extent of the challenges that would affect Syria's revolutionaries or the successes and failures of their experiments in self-organization. Rested at his home on November the 20th, 2012. Shortly beforehand, he said, we are no less than the Paris Commune workers. They resisted for 70 days and we are still going on for a year and a half. He was detained with 85 others in a cell of four meters by four. This contributed to the deterioration of his already weak health. He was later transferred to Adra prison where he died in February 2013 day before his 60th birthday. But his vision had a huge impact. Local councils, sometimes known as revolutionary councils, sprouted in 2012, especially and by necessity in the north as the regime withdrew. With the regime's retreat came the withdrawal of government services. Local councils ensured the provision of humanitarian aid and the fulfillment of basic needs, including water, electricity, education, and waste disposal. 
They coordinated <clears throat> on security with armed resistance groups. Councils follow no single model, and each has a different size and capacity. Members are civil activists, family and tribal leaders, people selected for their technical or professional skills. In general, they implement a form of representative democracy, and three local elections have been held in some areas, now I would say many areas, um, the first free elections in Syria in over four decades. Thank you. Uh, the, the book by, by you and, uh, and Leil is packed with mem memorable uh, lines. I just wanted to open with uh, this from the beginning. Syria was once known as a kingdom of silence. In 2011, it burst into speech, not in one voice, but in millions. For a few brief moments, the people changed everything. Then the counter-revolutions drowned them down. I, I, one of the things that struck me reading this stunning, stunning book, um, a note of pessimism. Even though you're touching on some of the alternatives, and those alternatives still exist, and we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit, some of the grassroots movements are still there. There was a pessimism there that this was an uprising that in a sense, may have been doomed because of all the, the state actors and some of the more conservative elements within Syrian society itself. Uh, that was potentially going to grind, grind down this more liberal or libertarian-minded rights-based focus. You finished this book in, what, October last year? Are you more pessimistic since you finished this book about w the direction mm -hmm. of travel? Or is, is uh, the alternatives, that positivity, is that still there? The first thing to say is that I, I don't think it was the inherent weaknesses of Syrian society or the inherent conservatism of Syrian society which doomed the revolution if it's doomed. Um, although Syrian society does, I don't have a rosy view of it, it, do, it, it <coughs> does have many cleavages and serious problems, of course, um, which have been played on and exacerbated by the regime. But I, I think that Syrian society itself not just liberal, middle-class, educated, what we would call educated people, but working-class and religious people as well, were, as um, Yara said here when she went to a conservative Muslim mm. area and one boy said, you should dress properly, another boy said, don't talk to her, don't tell her what to do, she, it, she, we're here for our freedom, she should choose. Now, <coughs> that doesn't mean that Maidan was about to become a, a liberal kind of New York or, or something, of course not. Um, but it means that the ordinary working-class Syrian people were suddenly talking in public about these issues and debating them. So everything was up for grabs, and in some ways still is. Um, I think it was the regime um, and its backers, and also the West and the Gulf in different ways. But it was primarily the regime. It was the counter-revolution and the violence of the counter-revolution and the sectarianism of the counter-revolution which brought us to the deliberately which brought us to the path that we, where we are now. Mm. But about optimism and pessimism, um, I think that you know, you're, you're, you're constantly swinging between the two poles. I, I think that's true. I kind of wish that the last mm. sentence of the afterword, I was not happy when I wrote it, um, was, I think the last word is annihilation. Um, it's the people who dared to ask for freedom received annihilation. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's fairly um, depressing. Um, Slightly, yeah. I, I, I must... Look, here's, here's my point of view. I am both pessimistic and optimistic. Most of all, I think, logically, I must be pessimistic because look at this situation. It's still exponentially increasing. When we're, They're talking about a peace process and so on. It's theatre. It's like an Arab-Israeli peace process. It's, it's not really a peace process. It's not designed to be a peace process. The Russians... It, the Russian intervention... And we wrote all of the book except the afterword before that happened... The Russian imperialist assault, um, you know, 80% of their bombs are hitting the um, opposition to both Assad and ISIS. They're hitting the people that you need to be there to be negotiating the a future settlement. Um, they're hitting democratic nationalists as well as um, Islamists. Um, they're creating more refugees. There's a quarter of a million more displaced since the Russian bombing began. So we're this thing is getting worse and worse and worse, and I, I think that we have to speak very honestly and openly about that. When people pretend that we're heading towards a settlement, we're not. Mm. 
it's, it's getting much worse, it's worsening, and that has immediate implications for everybody in the world because we're so globalised now. Um, so I am pessimistic. Yeah. The counter-revolution has been awful. At the same time, um, that comes in the context of, you know, the body of this book is, is the story that the media in general has not been telling you. You know, the body of this book is about democratically, there are over 400 democratically elected local councils in Syria. There are tens of free newspapers and magazines which debate and discuss all kinds of things. Um, there's there's um, a huge range of ideas amongst Syrians still inside and amongst refugee uh, uh, communities in exile. Um, and that's not going away. So the positive way of looking at all the disasters in the Arab world in the, in the last five years is that we're at the beginning of a very long process, and I don't know how it's going to end. I think that's the interesting thing for me in this book. It's something we, as an organization at Amnesty, deal with all the time in our, our work on working with civil society groups. And I, it's inevitable. Civil society groups, you know, the underground newspapers and, and what have you, are not going to make headline news. Why would they? The news agenda likes things that explode and they're like the macabre theater of ISIS and groups like that, obviously. But, you know, it's interesting. I remember chatting with um, uh, Anas al-Abda, political committee for the Syrian coalition, that, and we were talking about positives and, and negatives, and I think in, in one way, if you stand back and look at Syria and think where it was in February 2011, so a few weeks before what we would call the, the, the beginnings of the uprising, and where Syrian civil society is now, or where political opposition is, put aside the humanitarian crisis, put aside the massive destruction, it's more recognized, it's more well-funded, although that has its problems, and you touched on that in the book. Uh, it's got more awareness, it's more coordinated, it's got more ground, more territory inside Syria than it did. So in one sense, there's actually a lot to still build on. Yes. Um, and if we, if we, I guess if we move away, as, you, as you're touching on, if we move away from... Uh, the news, the mainstream news filtered version of what's going on in Syria and look at that grassroots. There is some positives, but I don't know if there's any, you talk about the local coordination committees a lot, maybe people here don't know a lot about them. Some will do, I can see some people here are very knowledgeable on Syria. Maybe expand a little bit about the LCCs and, and, and the vital work they have done and, and are still doing. The local coordination committees, so before the councils, first kind of organic revolutionary organization were um, coordination committees. The most well-known um, group of committees is called the local coordination committees, which Razan Zaytouni um, was very much involved with in a human rights lawyer and revolutionary. Um, and these were groups of five to ten people, five, seven people in each neighborhood. Um, and it was, of course, kept secret, because as soon as the regime found out who were in these committees, they would come and pick them up and kill them. Um, and they, their first job was to coordinate protests. It was to organize protests in, the, in their local community and to, to coordinate with other committees. Um, and they were also guiding things as, far, as much as they could in a positive direction. So, for example, if as a demonstration people spontaneously came out with a sectarian slogan or chant, somebody from the committees would run over and, and explain, look, this isn't helping us. That's just going to scare that community. It's going to make them think that we want to kill them. It's going to make them support the, the regime. And, you know, so um, it was because of the local coordination committees that you found that every Friday you were seeing the same slogans and themes across the country. And then as the repression kicked in, um, they, uh, Razan also set up the Violations Document, doc Documentation Centre, which was connected to the committees. So a large part of their job became recording and documenting violations, recording and documenting first the crimes of the regime against the people, the, uh, the deaths, the wounded, the etc., etc., the rapes and all of this, um, getting the news out to the media, um, and... Uh, and then, of course, later, when, it, when the thing became militarized, I mean, Razan was, was offering human rights training to militias and, and so on, and she was... Um, Razan Zaytouni, of course, is one of the Duma four, four people, four activists who were kidnapped, abducted in 2013 yeah. um, in Duma, where they'd been living and working, um, probably by Jaysh al-Islam, 
um, which is a, a, a militia run by Zahran Alush, who was assassinated by the Russians recently. Um, and because she was speaking out, Razan was the kind of revolutionary who was against every authoritarian wherever they, wherever they came from. Now, since the abduction, I mean, that was a big blow to the local coordination committees, but they're still there. Um, they're still in regime areas trying to organize when it's possible. It's much more difficult these days, protests, um, and um, keeping, you know, keeping a network, an underground network of solidarity. When land was liberated and when it became a war situation and so on, then the councils started, and then you could have elections when the regime wasn't actually there with it, able to pick people up. They could have elections and work in, in public. And, and should say as well, the book is, is uh, dedicated to Razan. I got, I got to say, when I first started reading this, I got a chill when I read that line. In many ways, Razan's fate mirrors Syria's. Um, the book is dedicated to her, of course, and, and every free Syrian. And it's interesting as well because, you know, you, you would be in the sort of popular consciousness associated with as an anti-Assad figure, but it's probably more complex than that, obviously. It's more anti-authoritarian. But you, you've, you've chosen to dedicate, you and Layla have chosen to dedicate the book to somebody who, yes, had their run-ins with the regime, but ultimately, as, as most of us think, was disappeared by an armed opposition group. I'll say opposition in quotation marks to an extent, because you know they, 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 some could say groups like that have been actually counter-revolutionary forces. Um, against the ideals that people like Razan had. But it'd be interesting to know how, how that's gone down as well. Um, you know, dedicating a book to someone uh, like Razan, or has, has, has that not been uh, explored yet fully within opposition circles, I should say. Because it is, I, I would I say, it is, it is a complex. Today. This, is, yeah. this is the launch. It, so is, it, is, it is a complex point, I would say, as well, because there was a, there was a meeting um, in Saudi Arabia uh, of opposition groups which the Saudis pulled together and, and we as an organization persuaded some of the more human rights friendly people within the coalition, the, the Syrian coalition, to raise this case. And they were very nervous about doing it, but they did it and, and the call was on the, on the, on the Saudi uh, government to pull some strings with Jaysh al-Islam. Uh, it didn't happen, to my knowledge, it didn't happen. There was too much nervousness within the coalition. and. You know, you've touched on it in the book as well, that the Saudis and the Qataris, to an extent, have also been counter-revolutionary forces. H how damaging do you think their involvement actually has been with the popular I, struggle? I do think it has been damaging, and I'll say why in a, I don't know which to say first. Okay, first, it has been, it has been damaging, of course. The, um, everybody's response has been damaging. Um, um, the free army, the defectors from the military, the people who couldn't stand being ordered to shoot civilians every day, and local men who picked up weapons to defend themselves, who had no ideology other than we want to stop this regime killing us, and we want the Syrian people to choose what comes next. Those people should have been supported. Um, they, should, they, should, they should have been supported properly in, 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 in 2012, and they, it should have been done, um, of course, the free army itself, you can blame them, you can blame the coalition, you can blame the fractiousness of the Syrians and everything else. But um, I think the fundamental point is that you had different sponsors very tepidly and not properly arming people a bit, but different sorts of people and different militias. And then you got all these militias in competition with each other. And then you got some making videos of, look, we're fiercer and more Muslim than the other militia, so you should give guns to us instead mm. of... And so it should have been coordinated. Um, the West didn't want to get involved for all kinds of reasons. It actually actively stopped the Gulf countries mm -hmm. sending the weapons that the people really needed to defend themselves, which, and in, because they said we're scared that Islamists might get hold of some of these weapons indirectly. Well, a few years later, look what's happening. The, the, the West is bombing both Syria and Iraq because there's such an enormous problem with jihadists um, that wouldn't have existed if they'd armed the Free Army mm -hmm. in 2012. Um, so the Saudis and the Qataris and the Turks, by arming their own clients, mm. contributed to, the, to, to this. 
Um, the Qataris armed Islamists, not jihadists, okay. but, but, but Islamists. Um, the Saudis actually didn't. It's been really overdone. Mm. Apart from Jaysh al-Islam, yeah. um, they've, they've been funding free army groups, the Southern Front, and, and, and so on, because at the moment, as we saw in Egypt, where they helped Sisi's coup, they're scared of mm. Islamism, except their own version. Um, um, so, uh, but Jaysh al-Islam, when we come to organizations like Jaysh al-Islam and Ahrar al-Sham, these two, they're all, they're Syrian organizations. They're not, they're not like Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS, international jihadist groups with an international global agenda. They're Syrian organizations, and both of them have said, whether they believe, really think, think it or not, I don't know, but both of them have said that they are willing to work in a, some kind of democracy. They want an Islamic state, but they're not going to force it on the Syrian people. And both of them practically have shown themselves able to work with free army groups and local councils and people who think differently from, from them. They do have a Syrian support base. Mm. It's not enormous, but they do have it. In Douma, Jaysh al-Islam, Zahran al this, uh, um, they and the clerics associated yeah. with this organization have a support base, unlike ISIS, which doesn't have a real support base. It's trying to build one now. It's trying to engineer one. Um, so these people have to be involved in any final solution. They're both revolutionary and counter-revolutionary. Yeah. I'm, I'm in the difficult position of supporting Jaysh mm. al-Islam when it's fighting the regime or trying to defend its area, rather, from the regime. Um, I support them. And when Russia kills Zahran Alush in, a, in an airstrike, the leader of Jaysh al-Islam, I think that's a terrible crime and it's, and it's pushed peace a lot further away. Um, at the same time, I recognize that they are counter-revolutionary in that they're probably disappearing our best and brightest revolutionary activists. They're not, they don't do it regularly, but they did it with, with yeah. those. Um, and they're, um, they're not very nice people. And, and, and Zahran Alush um, made some very sectarian remarks um, about cleansing Damascus of Shia influence, which might have meant um, a future government won't be influenced by Iran, mm. but could have meant that we're going to kick Shia and Alawis out of the capital. That's certainly how most Shia and Alawis yeah. read it, and it didn't help the, the revolutionary. No. It, 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 it's something that didn't build a lot of confidence in people who may not have been pro-Assad or pro-regime, but wanted the stability of the government, let's say, and it's probably been one of the failings of uh, opposition groups. I mean, you know, we talk about Jaysh al-Islam a lot, Adal al-Sham as well, doing joint operations with Al-Qaeda's affiliates uh, in Syria doesn't bring confidence. And I guess one of the difficulties is, uh, and, you know, this conversation has happened a lot about, you know, maybe there was a point in 2012 where if there was increased arming, there may have been a tipping point. I think you probably agree with that. Mm. I guess the difficulty is the analysis, the people doing the security assessments, the policy makers looking at risk were thinking, well, hmm, how are these people gonna use these weapons? Yes, they might well fight the regime, but how are they gonna use them uh, later, post-regime? Well, I would have never expected any Western country to be giving weapons to Jaysh al-Islam or Ahrar al-Sham. I'm talking about the free army yeah. groups, which yeah. in fact they do give weapons to sometimes. Mm. When it's, like for example, when the Russian invasion and bombing began, suddenly in the yep. first day, 24 Assad tanks were taken out by free ar vetted non-jihadist free army groups. Those were Saudi supplied anti-tank missiles, but they were, the Saudis had got permission to supply them from the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, because if they, if they give without permission, then the Americans will stop selling them weapons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes. Although ironically, probably those, those vetted uh, armed, uh, armed opposition groups, they're probably their biggest enemy, especially in the north, was, was Jabhat al-Nusra. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a complicated thing. I, mm, uh, um, you see, there we go. The, 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 to make, maybe to make a point or to show the Russians that it wasn't going to be that easy, mm. in the first couple of weeks after the Russian invasion, all these anti-tank missiles, so that what they needed was anti-aircraft missiles, what the mm. civilians needed. But... All these anti-tank missiles were there, great. And now, the last few weeks, we haven't seen any yeah. being used. The, the bombing is even heavier. The, the Iranian and Lebanese and Iraqi and Syrian troops are, are recapturing um, towns and villages. Um, and there are no, 
because Obama's decided that, well, we want to keep the Russians happy for the yeah. meeting in wherever it is that's relevant. Well, let's, before we bring the uh, audience in, it, it's, it's never, it's always it sounds like a simple question to ask in terms of where things go from here or what your hopes are. I suspect you're quite cynical about the Geneva process. Uh, but I'm, I suspect you'd also appreciate that the diplomacy has a role to play. Interestingly, though, in, in, in the end of your book, which I thought was the most positive part, actually, with regards to that last line, you talk about alternatives, uh, alternative ways of self-organization, of people working outside of state structures. Maybe unpack that a little bit, because I thought that was one of the more exciting parts of the book, actually, uh, near the end. What am I trying to say there? Well, that was a critique, really, of the left, mm. the dominant left. Um, not all of it. There's been some um, great leftist yeah. approaches to the Syrian revolution. You quote many of them as well. Revolution, and I quote some of them, and there's certainly Syrian leftists who've been thinking about it very clearly. Um, but too much of the left has been talking from a position of incredible ignorance, I must say. I'm d I don't blame the people, necessarily. I blame the key journalists and um, commentators that many of us, me included, um, I used to admire some of these people, um, who have really done a disservice, I think, have done some very, very poor reporting. And it's really commentary dressed up as reporting, and it's commentary which is retreated into campism. In other words, a kind of Cold War thing where they see it, they, they can't see the Syrian people, they zoom out and they think they see a struggle between America and Iran, or between imperialism and anti-imperialism, or... Or between, you know, or between Putin's anti-imperialism, mm. that's what, and, and American imperialism, or, or something like this. And that's, you know, leftists in the past, I don't think, you know, in the 1930s in Spain and so mm. on, the, the people were responding in a much more, with a, a lot more human solidarity. Um, I heard a, an, a very depressing anecdote about Noam Chomsky, um, who met a group of Syrian leftists. I was told this by one of the people he met. He, he was in Beirut and he asked to meet a group of Syrian leftists. So a group was rattled up and, 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 and they were sat down with Chomsky. And he basically said to them, look, your revolution's over and you better, you know, it's probably best for, for, for the world if you accept that um, because imperialism has taken over your revolution. Mm. And this is the great Noam Chomsky. He's an old man now, so maybe he's, um, we shouldn't, like Fisk and so on, so maybe they, it's a question of age or something. But it, it seems to me like a basic, it doesn't, before you get to left or right, it's just a basic human principle. That when there's something going on in a country, you go and ask the people in the country about it. You, if you are a leftist, you analyze the relationship between oppressing and oppressed classes in that country, in that context. That's first, before you start worrying about the the geopolitics and the chess game of states. We, the people seem to think there's some good states and bad states. You know, states are all bastards. They're, they're all they're, 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 they're apparatuses for keeping elites happy and comfortable and secure. That's what states are. And some of them are, are, are better than others. Some of them have more space for other people's rights as well. Mm. Um, but that's what a state is. And you can't expect a state to behave like a human being, as if this is a, this is a human being that I love, this is one that I hate. Mm. No, states are... You know, and, and states act in contradictory ways. So there's the Islamist um, Saudi Arabia, where women aren't allowed to drive, but it, it, it funds the counter-revolution in Egypt, which removes an Islamist party from power. So we, when we go at it, Saudi Arabia is the root of... It, it, it's much more complicated than that, and I think we should start our, our analysis from people, yeah. not, from, not from states. Yeah. It, the Syrian people have built incredible alternatives in the most difficult of situations, the committees and the councils and, and, and the newspapers and the cultural explosion, in terrible situation, when they're being bombed, when foreign powers are fighting them, and when transnational jihadists are in there oppressing them as well. The whole world is against them and they're doing this. And, and, and we're kind of lecturing them about how they should, you know, understand that stability requires, an anti the anti-imperial cause requires that you make your peace with the Iranian soldiers who are killing you. It's just absurd. Uh, there we go. Yeah. I think that we have a lot. I think that we shouldn't just be feeling sorry for Syrians. We shouldn't be ignoring Syrians. We should be doing more than feeling sorry. Yeah. We should be actually learning from them because they've done incredible things. 
I think um, one, one of the good things about the book as well, it, it's for those people who I guess would describe themselves as progressives, leftists, liberals, whatever, human rights activists, it's a great resource, not just uh, for the, the, the first hand quotes from a lot of the uh, activists in here, but at the back as well, you've got a whole list of uh, you know, underground newspapers and, uh, and other books and blogs, new sites, activism. Uh, which people can check out, and you know, like I said, this st stuff doesn't get into the mainstream media, and why should it? It's, it's not going to. It, this is grassroots activism. But those people who are genuinely interested uh, in progressive politics would actually <laughs> engage in this and try and educate themselves uh, a little bit about it. But the reason why it should, because it's true, like why should it? Nobody wants to know about activism. But in the previous decade, we you know, the West, or America and Britain, actually not the West, America and Britain invaded Iraq, supposedly in order to bring them democracy, yeah, with tanks. And of course that wasn't what it was really about, but that's what was the excuse was. So that, and that was a big discourse, the democratization of the Middle East and so on. And now there are people doing it themselves. They're not asking you to bring it in on tanks or whatever, in, you know, out of necessity, and, and because they're having a revolution and really thinking about things and working, um, they're, they're trying to make democratic structures yeah. themselves, and we don't even know it's happening. Yeah. Well, I, I could explore this area for hours, but we've got an audience who have come along and probably want to have, ask questions. We've, have we, who's got the roving mic, by the way? Someone from Pluto Press hopefully has a roving mic. No? Nope. We've got a roving mic. So if you just want to put your hands up, say who you are, um, and wait till the roving mic comes to you. Okay, so we've got a person right at the front over here as well. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the introduction and the conversation. My name's Shahini. I'm really interested in the way that you approached the book, um, how you and your co-author decided to write it, because you've been talking about the way in which the conflict is talked about by um, commentators on the left and how they tend to try and go for the big picture of the um, struggle, power struggle between the states, and they kind of miss the perspective of the Syrians. Um, so could you maybe talk about how you tried to overcome those sorts of problems in the way that you approached the material? Because I understand that, I haven't read the book yet, but I've got a copy, but I understand that you use testimony and could you maybe talk about yeah. the kind of the form that you used? We tried to put it in a context. I think there's a real gap in Syria. There, uh, until a couple of years ago, there were almost no books about Syria in England, very few. Um, and now there's suddenly quite a few, but um, they do tend to be, and some of them are really very good. For example, I just read Charles Lister's excellent mm -hmm. Syrian Jihad, which is an excellent book, but it's focused on, in profound detail, on um, Jabhat al-Nusra and um, ISIS and Ahrar al-Sham and yep. al-Islam, the Islamist groups. Um, so we've, we, we, we tried to can't tell the whole story, but we tried to tell the whole story. So the first chapter is background from the beginning of time mm -hmm. to Hafiz al Esser. Mm -hmm. The second chapter, um, we still don't get to the revolution. The second chapter is Bashar's first 10 years in power and his illusory Damascus Spring, the hopes for reform and how they were dashed, and then what, what he did with the economy um, and what happened to society in that period immediately before the revolution. And then the revolution, the grassroots structures, the militarization of the revolution, the Islamization, which we try and put in a context. And we do try, although I'll come back to that. Um, and then we have a chapter on culture, which I think is important as well, how culture was transformed during the revolution. That's an, an essential part of the story, which is usually missed out. And it's one of the longest lasting mm. aspects of it. Um, and then at the end, we have a Two chapters. There's a chap there is a chapter on the geopolitics, the roles that different states played, and also the Syrian elites, the coalition, the National Council, etc., etc. And then there's a final chapter, which is called The Start of Solidarity, which is about um, how the media has responded badly, I think, to it, and how we should perhaps be responding. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we use testimony, and I would say that if you don't buy a copy, if you end up just like coming across it in a library at some point, and you have five minutes, I would advise you just to go through the quotes, find the block quotes, 
we, what we wanted to do was amplify Syrian voices, which of course are sometimes contradictory. We wanted to amplify Syrian voices. We deliberately decided to amplify revolutionary voices, but that's from a range of, I mean, we've interviewed people from kind of moderate democratic Islamists to anarchists, you know, but um, we wanted revolutionary voices because we think those voices aren't being heard properly. But we also tried to give contextualize the point of view of people that we don't agree with. So we've tried to explain, give some background to explain why jihadism, Salafism and so on might make sense to some people, even though it makes no sense to us. And also why some Alawis are still loyal to the regime. I know Alawis who hate the regime, but are still loyal. Um, I think they're wrong, mm -hmm. but I understand why they think like that, and we've tried to, right. to explain this background, how sectarian fears and resentments have been exploited by the regime and others, mm. um, and how the effects this has had. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Who else has um, questions they want to ask? Stick your hand up. Yep, we've got in the corner. Yep, over here. Keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Yep. I apologize that it's not really a question. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I arrived late and I apologize for that as well. Okay. <laughs> but I knew what the book was about. I haven't read it yet. But I'm so happy that there is a book that makes visible and makes heard the voices that are missing. As you say, both left and right have colluded in, in making the revolution and the revolutionaries and the Syrian people invisible. And sometimes it's a very difficult question. I mean, it feels you ask the question in despair, what can I do to express my solidarity? What concretely can I do? And I'm just going to, if you don't mind, suggest one very concrete and practical thing. Um, there is a petition going round for the UK government to drop aid to people to besieged areas in Syria. Now this is very embarrassing for the UK government because they claim to be doing some good in Syria but we know that it's totally counterproductive what they are doing, bombing ISIS, uh, or claiming to be bombing ISIS in Syria. Um, it would be a good use of the Air Force if they would <laughs> drop some food instead. It would also be very embarrassing to the regime and to indeed their allies, the Russians. So, there. 58,000 people have actually signed this petition, which is a very, very good start. Um, so where, should, where should people find this petition? Yeah, well, they'll find it on the events page, because I put it on the events page before I, oh. <laughs> before I came here, Christian. Of which organization? Um, all right, well, it's on your events page, is this it? events page. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but that was it's quite cunning. <laughs> it's also on the, the Syria Solidarity okay. UK website page. Well, that I would okay. recommend that people, if people are interested, they look up the Syria Solidarity UK people because they've got a, um, all kinds of ideas and they can connect people to charities and campaigns and, and so on. They've got a no bombing, a no bomb zone no campaign bomb zone. going, which is worthwhile. Yeah, no food, no bombs. Uh, we tried to get the petition to actually say no food, no bombs, food but it was bombs. turned down by the UK, by the, uh, the food, no bombs. petition. Hopefully food, not food, bombs. Sorry. Bombs. Yeah. <laughs> food, okay. Food, so not there's bombs. A, there's a petition on the, food, not bombs. there's a petition on the Syria Solidarity website. It is a discussion on airdrops that is happening within the UK government, within DFID, with the UN, uh, with USAID, with other I know there's a lot of skepticism, quite rightly. I mean, for, we're not a humanitarian organization, but obviously from a humanitarian perspective, it's not the most effective way of delivering aid, but we're in desperate times, as we know, as we've seen the pictures of multiple uh, besieged areas uh, that people need aid. And the, the discussions around risk and policy can be quite infuriating, uh, but aid needs to be delivered in an effective way. and. You know, that discussion, that pressure, discussion needs to be had. It puts pressure on. It if, does, yeah. If the UK... What this petition is for, really... Okay, no, no, no. Sorry, we, I just we, want, I want to bring in I want to bring I know, in other people. I just people. want to finish, though. Sorry, Clara, I want to bring in other people. All right, I, I just we, want to finish. What it's for is to get a debate in Parliament if we get 100,000 signatures. And I'm asking Amnesty International to use your resources sure. to plug it. Thank you I'm very much. I'm just plugging much. it thank now. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, we've got a question over here. 
Keep your hand up, though, so they can see you. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's really refreshing that you decided to focus on the Syrian people. Um, my, my sort of four parents um, are from the Caribbean. Um, and in the Caribbean, in that side of the world, Syrians um, have done remarkable things. Um, there are many heads of state, um, heads of state of Jamaica, um, of Argentina, um, who have Syrian background. Steve Jobs, obviously, is a famous one in the Americas as well. Um, and my, my personal experience of Syrians has been very, very impressive. And it's, it's, it's almost... It, it, I'm, re I'm really surprised that, like, the portrayal of Syrians, um, you know, the popular portrayal of Syrians is just so... goes so against what I really understand Syrians to be like. Um, no one's perfect, of course, but, you know, they have a tremendous history and legacy um, there. What, what I wanted to ask is... What do you think are the, you know, sort of going to be the long-term effects um, of, you know, of war, of this sort of, I suppose, brutalization um, of, you know, of this on, on, you know, on Syrian people? I mean, do you think that, um, yeah, you know, what are the long-term effects going to be? Any idea? Well, it's re I don't know. I mean, uh, long-term effects. It's so it's a really a bad question. I mean, I mean, uh, Wasim, uh, who's sitting there, <laughs> Wasim and I were in uh, Atme camp in the north of Syria at one point. Remember the little boy who um, one minute was um, cuddling up to Wasim, wasn't he? He was, all, he was all cuddly and friendly. He was a little five-year-old or something, and he was kind of cuddling up and all friendly and nice and little, cute little boy. And then, I don't know what happened, the expression on his face changed like this and suddenly he was like full of violence and uh, you know kind of I know I know kids are violent but this was a different thing it was I, I the camp there was full of obviously traumatized kids now what happens to them I don't know I don't I'm not a I'm not an expert not an expert in there's a, a, a you, you touch on it in the book though don't you in terms of you know you were contextualizing the rise of um, more conservative elements um some of the armed groups that, you know, the, the, the trauma of not just torture, besiegement, having bombs being dropped on you, seeing your family wiped out, you know, even the most liberal human rights friendly person could feel, I want to pick up a gun and I want to get revenge. And that's what brutalization and torture can do. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily what happens in the future, it's what's happening now. And, you know, it, Again, you touched on it in the book as well, uh, a number of times, how this is a deliberate strategy of the regime to brutalize the population, to um, elicit, you know, and this is going back to 2011, elicit an armed response and a violent armed response, certainly not a response that abides by the rules of international humanitarian law. As people like Razan were trying to plead with, uh, with armed groups in those early days, developing codes of conduct and, and what have you. Um, so I think you do, you do explore that quite a lot. Yes, uh, there's a deliberate strategy about the regime. <laughs> <laughs> but when I'm put on the plot, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's bit, what are the results going to be? It's true, it's happening mm. now. I mean, yeah. Abdurrahman Jaloud, who I, when I first read, I read his torture story, and he, he, I'm, I quote him later on as yeah. well in the militarization chapter, where he says that the first cause of people picking up a gun was being tortured. He says, almost all the people I know who were, who were detained and tortured, as soon as they got out, they went and got a gun. People who didn't think of that beforehand. Um, it, it's natural. You've been, like, humiliated and broken, um, raped, probably. You know, you've been, you've been treated in the most ho horrific way. Um, and you come out, and you're, you're full of a need to avenge yourself and make yourself feel like you're something again. That's why they do it. Yeah, yeah. Anybody, um but I mean, I would say that it's not just that. It's like also people living for years on end in these camps. Yeah. Um, in the worst ones are inside the country, but then there are terrible ones outside the country too. And I mean, I, I kind of tried to imagine myself in that situation. And again, with Seema and I saw it because the first time um, I was in Atme camp, I met a woman who I met again six months later. The first time I met a lovely woman with three daughters and. Um, she, lovely family, and um, the first time I met her, she was kind of, well, it's hard, but we'll put up with it, you know, it'll, a few more months and we're going home and, we'll, and it'll be so much better and we'll look back on these days and kind of remember that it was tough, but, you know, we had to do it. Mm. 
second time I went back, six, you know, six months later, she, she said, we're not going home, are we? Mm. I said, I don't know. And she said, we're not, you know, we're not going home. And, she, and, 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 and there was a very different expression on her face. And the whole camp felt a bit different the second time from the, f the first time. And that must be so much worse now. People are sitting there in these tents, which are freezing cold or freezing hot, um, with no work and no future, no, no school. How do you deal with that? You can deal with that for six months, but when you think this is the future for my children as well and my grandchildren as well, what do you do? I mean, yeah, desperation sets in. Um, that's why people are drowning in the Mediterranean. Got a question at the front, yeah. Hello, my name is Melody. Um, thank you for the introduction. It was really interesting, and especially the passages. And I had a question about the process to peace and how you see this from your perspective and maybe some of the, of the perspectives that you've had uh, during your research. And because there's always this contradictory process. You talk about arming the free, we should have armed the free army and then people who have been tortured picking up arms. And you also talk about the local community, the LCCs, local community councils, and uh, the more, I guess, democratic process, activism. So I was wondering, how do you see the pre peace process? Is it going to be an armed peace, uh, an armed revolution, or do you see it more maybe as a, as a, I don't know, a democratic process? And do you think that there's a chance for things like, like LCCs and generally activism to kind of pick up? And even you were talking about newspapers. Do, how do you see that process happening and the balance maybe between the two? Well, I think we're very far away from it. Um, so I could talk about issue, things that we could be doing to try to get closer to it. But um, I hope that one day we do come to a position where we can have a real peace process and, 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 and um, pro-regime communities will have to be involved in that. They will have to have a say in that. Um, I think that will be a lot easier when there is no regime um, because... Um, at the moment, you see, in the Alawi community, for example, most of which has remained loyal, even if most of those people probably don't like the regime, they've remained loyal um, to the regime. Um, at the moment, people, Alawis inside Syria, it's it, almost impossible for them to discuss things or to organize outside of regime or local warlord structures, because they'll just be found, I mean, they're, they're, the regime is very scared about um, opposition, because it, de it depends on the Alawi community for its survival. Or its officers are Alawis in the main. Its crack troops are Alawis. Um, it, it, it depends on the Alawi community for survival. This is why it did this horrible sectarian provocations to create a sectarian war because n now it's got the and it's it's also why opposition in the Alawi community over decades has been weeded out. You know, leftist Alawis were ruthlessly eliminated. Um, religious leaders in the Alawi community who who might, may have been independent were ruthlessly eliminated over decades. So um, so this means that the Alawi communi community doesn't have any leadership other than the regime and the Assads. Now, if the Assad regime went they would suddenly think, well, we have to find our own representatives to talk to the other side or the other sides and, and to, to, to try and like, keep our rights and our security going. And it, when they would come up with their own leadership that people would have to... And we also have to involve Ahrar al-Sham and Jaysh al-Islam because they have constituencies. We have to, and I think one way, how can we... Incredibly polarised ideologically by sect, by, by, by ethnicity at this stage after, after years of war. So... How could we keep Syria together? And I think we need to, because if you have a Sunni state and an Alawi state, the Sunni state will be jihadist and traumatized and nobody will want to deal with it. It won't have access to the sea. It'll be a disaster for the Syrians and for the world. The Alawi state will be fought over by Russia and Iran. It will be a disaster for, for European stability. I don't think anybody wants that, not just the Syrians. Um, what you could do is with the, using the local councils. The Saudis yeah. should have brought to their opposition negotiation team representatives of the councils yeah. because they are more important to the settlement than anybody else. Because in the future, with a decentralized model, if the councils had more power, then, for example, in Tartus, which is a liberal coastal city with lots of religious minorities, lots of Alawis, um, 
the local council would probably decide that alcohol is freely available, for example. In Hama or Dera Zord, more conservative Sunni Muslim areas, the local councils may decide that we want to ban alcohol. That's okay. The different areas, according to the composition of the population, they, can, they could do that. That could also allow the Kurds autonomy. And if, if everybody had more autonomy, you know, if there was... An, an, uh, uh, we Arabs um, have this backward idea that um, a strong opposition people as well as regime people, Islamists and socialists, everybody have this idea that we need a strong central state to make the people strong. Um, because, and that's a hangover from colonialism because we saw that those Europeans have got strong, organized central states and they are stronger than us, so we have to emulate them. But we've, we've seen the evidence that actually strong centralized states are a disaster for the people who live within them in the Middle East. Um, the, the, you know, we want an Iraq in which you can be a Sunni or a Salafi Sunni or a, or a Shia or a Kurd or an atheist, but you can live in your own neighborhood and, and you, you can respect your neighbors and they can respect you. We want a Syria like that too. And is that model uh, still having some sort of central authority, parliamentary system, some form of presidential system is, is that what you're talking about it's a federation but within some centralized organizing principle where as you say you know there's there's, there's different legislation for different parts of society and, and maybe people who are more liberal could go and live in Tartus and those who are more conservative could look, go and live in a part of uh, Homs whatever um, is that is that the idea you're sort of expanding on there yeah I mean in it's not immediate because in, in the short term it's more war because it's still yeah. intensifying. But in the medium term, I would hope that maybe we could get to something where you have a decentralized federation. Yeah. Um, in the long term, I would like it if everybody in every country could kind of think a bit beyond the state, yeah. where, um, where central government has less power and individuals have more power, and communities and workplaces and you know, groups of people who are working together on something are more able to make their own decisions. So, for example, I would like it in this country if the people making decisions about the health service were doctors and nurses yeah. and patients rather than whoever they are. And, and this model... <laughs> I mean, this model is very much... Even though there's nods towards civil society engagement with the Geneva process, it's always going to be tokenism. Um, there's opportunities there, and this is why I go back to the, the swings between negativity and positivity in, in, in the narrative here, that this is incredibly positive if, you know, international, regional, and local civil society can get itself together to organize its own conferences, its own um, alternatives to the state structured model, because I, I personally, I think with the best will in the world, even if Geneva happens, uh, regardless of the Russians and the Iranians, the Saudis and the Qataris don't want a credible democracy in Syria. It's a threat to their model. Yes. Why would they Absolutely. want it in Syria, given what they're doing to Nobody wants it. human rights activists and liberals and Democrats in their own country? Uh, that's another area we can pick up on. Uh, chap in the cap uh, has a question as well, yeah? It, it actually picks up from, from that point. Uh, I was wondering how you would, how would you rate uh, the outside actors uh, in terms of the worst contributors to this to this disaster, um, Iran, uh, Saudi, uh, the United States, how do you rate them in your mind? Who's the worst? Of, who's the worst offender uh, first? And and if you could sort of give us just a little brief of your opinion about about each of the actors. Wow. I mean, I should start by saying, you know, as a general principle, they're all bad. I don't expect any of them to be good. So, I, you know, my problem is with campism. I, I, I don't want to be in a camp which says this one's better than this one because they're all bad. And they're all, or maybe bad is not the word, they're all following their own con often contradictory, even within one state, agendas. Um, but to answer your question, I suppose that um, Russia must be the worst. I mean, if... if, if when the, the uprising against Mubarak happened. If um, Mubarak had responded at the time um, with the way Assad did, a military response, and if the um, Americans had continued sending in attack helicopters and tanks and ammunition 
and um, so on. The, I would expect that the Western left would have been having huge demonstrations outside American embassies and, and so on. I mean, it's absolutely terrible what the Russians have been doing from the beginning. Um, they, they've been behaving with the Assad regime in the same way that America behaves with Israel. So they've been providing, uh, although it may even be worse because the scale of the killing is much bigger than in Israel. Um, they've, been provide, they've been arming him and funding him while he's been doing this. Um, they've been um, giving him intelligence, working on the ground and so on. They've, they've, they've also been shielding him at the UN from censure um, in the way that the Americans do with, with Israel. Um, then Iran, it's a great shame. I'm somebody who thinks that there never should have been sanctions on Iran for its nuclear program in the first place. That's not the way to deal with it. There should be a regional disarmament. Um, it's terrible that in the last, that since this started, um, Iran's Middle East policy or Iran, Iran has taken a, t a, a real nasty sectarian, expansionist, aggressive, imperialist turn. There's no excuse for it. You know, there are thousands of Iranian troops in Syria um, fighting Democrats. Um, there are thousands of transnational Shia jihadists which are organized by Iran from various countries also in Syria. This is a major cause of the rise of ISIS. A major cause of the rise of jihadism is, 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 is that there are Shia Muslims coming from all over the world for sectarian reasons to kill Syrians. And Iranian officials, it's funny that Western anti-imperialists still seem to think that Iran is an anti-imperialist power. Iranian government officials speak openly about how today we have an empire. We own three Arab capitals and soon we will own a fourth. You know, high government officials say things like this openly. America has been, you know, I've spoken about it already, I'm not going to repeat myself, I think the West has been appalling as well. Um, its rhetoric occasionally was quite good, but it was never matched by any action. And in fact, they stopped other, I'm not, they didn't have to arm people if they didn't want to, but they stopped other countries arming the free army when it could have made a difference. Mm. Um, I have a question in the middle there. Yeah, keep your hand up. Hi, um, my name's Flora. Um, you referred um, earlier, we well, began with the anecdote about um, connections across communities happi happening in um, the early days of the uprising. Um, and then you referred later about kind of sectarianism. Um, and I've, I've got a few Syrian friends who have kind of made comments about other religious communities and with a kind of sense of, of distrust. And um, I, I guess I wondered um, if you have any, um, if you've spoken to people about about any work going on across communities, or maybe it's happening anyway, you know, how, how yeah. is that enduring in terms yes, of Yes, that is happening. Um, yeah. Although, for example, we've been, I've just been saying that 90% of Alawis are su support the regime, even if a large portion of those don't like it. Um, there's still maybe 10% of Alawis who are working with the revolution. A lot of them are doing it in, in private because it's too dangerous and they d they're scared to even tell other family members that they're doing it. Um, I've met some of these people um, and then I've also met, I think, you know, there's a, a, a rapper called Abu Hajar. If, if any of you saw my thing in The Guardian a while ago about, it was in the G2 about arts and culture in the revolution and Abu Hajar was on the front cover of the G2 thing. Um, he's a, now based in Berlin and I hope that sometime this spring, maybe May, or something, we're going to actually bring Abu Hajar to London and do an event maybe at Rich Mix where um, I talk to him and then he does some performing. Um, but the, his story in, is in the book in quite yeah. some detail. He's from Tartus <coughs> and he's a kind of like libertarian leftist. He's not, he has no religion, but he, um, he, um, he says that in Tartus, the pro you know, they had at one point, they had two revolutionary committees. One was full of Alawis and one was full of Sunnis. <laughs> they were both revolutionary committees, but they were separate. And Abu Hajar was somebody who um, works with both communities. He says, he's, um, he says I'm neither Alawi nor Sunni, so, so, so I fit. Um, I think he may have a Sunni father and Alawi mother, I'm not sure. But, um, he's certainly got friends from both communities. So he and his friends were working very hard at building a cross-sect revolutionary um, committee and, and, and they were doing, in, in this, it's still going on, although he's now in Berlin, but it's still going on. They're doing important work um, introducing people to each other secretly and that gives the 
um, he says he's very worried that um, there could be a, the Alawis are in the majority in Tartus, and he says he's worried that there could be a slaughter of Sunnis at, at some point. Yeah. Um, or if the revolution wins, vengeful Sunnis could come to Tartus to kill Alawis, which is what the Alawis are expecting. So it's very important, this work that they're doing underground to make social links between people in the communities and, and uh, common projects yeah. that they can work on together. And then there's, you know, there's the groups. I mean, a lot of the groups that we at Amnesty have been working with since 2011, uh, that ethnicity, sect, is, regionalism is rarely even mentioned. You know, these groups are, are, are powered by their, their values, uh, usually rights-based values and and whilst they might have different identities you know they're trying to build literally a new Syria a, a new Syria based on ideas beyond sect groups like uh, al Haraq Syrian nonviolence movement who you mentioned um, no, but the pulse movement yeah, as well, pulse as well. set up in Homs I think originally by a yeah. small group of Alawis but and, and, and that its focus mm. is um, on mm. combating sectarianism from a pro-revolution. Yeah. I think the difficulty, though, while that's positive and while these groups are great and we'll always try and work with them and, and, and build them up and, and build up their skills as much as possible and their profile, is uh, a lot of them are now outside. I mean, Berlin, we, we were in Berlin uh, a few months ago doing some training. It's a real hotbed of really cutting-edge Syrian activists with good ideas, good values, but they're outside because the, the threats inside are just too difficult, not just from the regime, but from some of the more conservative uh, elements, and that's always gonna be the difficulty. Yes, there are still those operating in, in the underground, but frankly, the majority of them are outside, hoping some form of process, diplomatic process um, works. You know, at the moment, the Geneva process may be happening, may not be happening uh, again, on January the 25th, at the moment it doesn't look like it's going to happen. It's yeah, a at the moment it doesn't look it's, like it's going to happen. It's under, uh, under Russian auspices, and now the Russians and the Iranians are saying that they won't um, accept yeah. the um, opposition yeah. group because they have terrorists in them. And the Russian and Iranian definition of a terrorist yeah. is the same as Assad's. It's anybody who wants Assad to leave power is a terrorist. So it's not, not it's going in the same direction as the Oslo peace process. It's a, it's, it's a bit of theater to keep people thinking that something is happening. Um, if, if you, these activists were talking about doing all this great work, if you want them to be strengthened and want them to be able to go back into Syria, it's not necessary even to get rid of Bashar al-Assad from Damascus. It's mm. just necessary to stop the bombs. Mm. You know, what we need in Syria is a no-bombing zone. If, if, um, and that means that Russia has to be confronted, not necessarily militarily, but economically, diplomatically. We have to stop pretending that it's a, a peace partner when it's bombing Democrats in Syria. We have to um, stop the bombs falling. As soon as the bombs stop falling, then a lot of refugees will be able to go home and, and then automatically these councils and so on will demand to be involved in the negotiation process when it, there really is one. I mean, before we take some more questions, the, the no bombing zone idea or other, other ideas of um, intervention do demand some form of military action. Yes. At the minimum, bombing regime, military assets, radars, um, jets, helicopters, airfields. Um, which obviously would take things very far away from the diplomatic process, or may speed them up. I don't think it may you speed said, it up. You said earlier about the importance of a diplomatic process. I think a diplomatic process is really very important. If you have a diplomacy, is important. If you have a process, mm. if you have a strategy, if you are a, if you are going in a direction, then uh, diplomacy is absolutely essential. But we're not. Mm. We're not. You know, uh, smiling while the Russians are bombing the 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 the. the, 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 the I mean, the British and the Americans and others are actually donating some money to the councils. Yeah. I would like them quite, quite. A, I would like them to donate more, but they are doing some yeah. good work and they're working on some good projects and so on. But at, at the Frontline Club, um, I was talking about councils and how the British are actually giving some money. And then the guy from the Telegraph, Mr. Spencer, said, "Oh yes, um, I've, I saw some beautiful rubbish collection trucks which had been bought by a, I don't know if it was Britain or a European country, um, in Aleppo." And then the next day, they were bombed. Mm. You know, that's... <laughs> yeah. There you go. The reality is that everything you put in there is being bombed. Yeah. Which, to an extent, the second part of where I was kind of going with that is, 
whilst there's lots of talk of trying to keep Syria whole, in a sense, the trend is actually disintegration, yeah. if not some form of managed partition, which would be quite bloody and messy. Yeah. But that seems to be where the trend is going. Yeah. And again, that's a disaster for world security. The reason that we're going into that in that direction is that the Russians and the Iranians um, don't want to lose mm. influence in Syria. Mm. Um, they, at the moment, it looks like Russia's trying to get the whole country back for Assad. It obviously won't work. Mm. Um, so they will then come back to the situation that they were in before they um, intervened, which was that Assad had about a sixth of the country left. Mm, it's mm. what the French used to call useful Syria. Yeah. It's like Damascus, Homs, which is depopulated now, um, and the coast. And that's what they will try and hold on to as a rump. And therefore, Iran has its base next to Lebanon where it can communicate with Hezbollah and it has its image and it's next to Palestine so it can be relevant in the Middle East. And Russia has thumbed its nose at the West and Putin has shown his own people that he's a big Tsar and they have their military base. Um, that's what they're aiming for. And the West is going along with it, is not, is, not, is not making any noise. So we are heading towards partition. But as I've already said, that is not the end game. Mm. Uh, um, I, I, anything which leaves Bashar al-Assad in Damascus, if Bashar al-Assad is still in Damascus in 10 years' time, you will have a world jihad mm. you know, on a bigger scale than we have now. Mm. Um, th this murderer on the throne in Damascus, it's an affront to certainly to Muslims and to decent people everywhere, and it, 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 it's not going to end. Um, if he gets pushed back to Latakia, well, in Latakia, Tartus, on the coast where Alawis are, um, a lot of Alawis come from originally, half the population there is Sunni. If you want, you know, if there's going to be a sectarian cleansing, it's going to be much bigger than anything we've seen so far. If that does end up happening, the Alawis will get driven out of Homs and Hama, and they're not in Hama, Homs and We've seen Damascus. the seeds of this, though, aren't we? Under UN auspices, to Under UN auspices. This is what the world is bringing us to. Mm. It's, but it will not bring us to stability. It'll be these two states, will, uh, which will come out of it, will be at, in eternal war with each other two at the minimum, and with everybody else. Yeah. You know, they will be prof it will profoundly destabilize the whole region and the whole world even more than it's destabilized now. We've got time for one more question over here in the corner. Just wait for the microphone to come. Yeah. So you've, it's been such a rich conversation that I'm going to take up lots of bits with you later, I think. Um, but maybe you're not the best person to know about this, but just say if you're not. But, I mean, I hear a lot about track one diplomacy, which isn't really diplomacy, as you've outlined. And there's lots and lots of track three, which is the sort of mobilisation of civil society. And there's lots and lots of donors who are actually funding that at the minute. But have you got any? are you aware of much track two diplomacy going on about bringing different stakeholders from different sections together in order to inform the, the sort of track one. I've got no idea about the terminology. Track one is Sorry. government, track, track three one is civil like, society. Yeah, it's track like Geneva. Yes. Track three is civil society. And track two is whenever you bring business leaders, religious leaders, and people who would be have authority within their own communities, and you get them to decide on the peace. So, for example, Lebanon, mm. a lot of people would argue that's what happened there, and that's actually what brought peace after the war. Yeah, um... Well, has it been happening on the ground in Syria? Yes. Um, I'm not talking about outside people mm. kind of organizing it, but it has been happening on the ground in Syria, and less so now than earlier, but certainly in 2011, 2012, also in Homs, where this pulse yeah. gathering came up. There was also, for example, the, the Sunni heads of ham family and the Alawi heads of family all sat down together in 2011, didn't work out in the end, but it did for some months, and they made an agreement that whatever happens, we're not we're neighbours, we're not going to turn on each other, even if we find ourselves on different sides of a fight, we're going to remember that we're neighbours. So things like that have been going on and are still going on, and probably on a local level are reducing hatred and violence. But I don't know about government, about organisations sitting it's, it's people down. It's difficult because there are initiatives going on. There's some initiatives going on in Lebanon. There's happens to an extent inside the country. The difficulty is, is the massive suspicion that can happen when often it's outside actors or even NGOs. And you, you know, you, you have a go at some NGOs, quite rightly actually, because how, how, how donor money has been used within Syria. But the idea of 
you know, bringing together different communities who are, well, bigger picture, at war with each other, creates a lot of tension, creates a lot of suspicion. And I, uh, you know, I, I think we're a long way away, uh, a long way away from that. I mean, the Saudi meeting I mentioned earlier did bring together religious people, business people, armed actors, uh, civil society actors to an extent, but it was under the auspices of the Saudi regime. You know, what credibility really uh, does that have? However, ultimately though, if you do want to, I think if you want to keep the country together, state actors need to be involved. This will sound terrible, but Russia needs to be involved. Iran needs to be involved. They need to be involved. If, if, if I mean, that's going to be, that's always going to be a controversial thing uh, to say. But even if it's at the minimum of something... Well, then ISIS needs to be involved then as well, surely. Um, because I would disagree with that, but <laughs> I'll hear you no, out. I mean, if, you're, if your argument is that they, ha they ha um, have a vision for mm. what the future should be, mm. so does ISIS. Mm. They have a stake in it, so does ISIS. Mm. Um, you know, I mean... Mm. I, 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 I know where you're going with that. I know I where you're going I think that if, if the Russians yeah. and the Iranians kind of change their policy and uh -huh. are, are actually looking for a, a, a solution yeah. rather than just keeping yeah. Assad in power, which is an impossibility, yeah. then I would agree. I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's, it's what's the understanding is that are these two state actors rational actors in, in, in the grand scheme of things compared to a group like ISIS that want total world domination? They want everything. They want Iceland. They want New Zealand. I mean, they're not rational actors in that sense. And, and I understand where you're going with the sense that both non-state and state actors are committing mass atrocities, but... Would you call the Iranians rational actors in this? I don't know. It depends what you call rational. I mean, I don't know. I think that, yes, they are rational, but then ISIS also is very rational. I mean, for it example, rationality, yeah. cutting people's heads off, for example, it's obviously horrible barbarism, but it's very intelligent because mm. the, more, the more films that soldiers see of, of, of um, other soldiers having their heads cut off, the less likely they are to resist when ISIS turns up in town. They're going to run away, and that works. You know, it's, um, so, so they, there is a rationale before, mm. behind everything they do. When they burnt that Jordanian sure. pilot sure, in a cage a and made yeah. a beautiful um, mm. film of it, shot from different angles and, and, and very skillfully mm. and so on, this was a, a, a perfect yeah. rationale behind that. But they are beyond the pale. I mean, that's the, I think that's the point... But that's why are they, be, I mean, I agree with I agree. you, they're beyond the pale, but yeah. why is Russia not beyond the pale when it's bombing schools and mm. hospitals yeah. and it's killing more, a lot more yeah. people than ISIS is? I agree. I agree. I, I don't think, I don't, from a diplomatic point of view, and we're not a diplomatic organization, but I guess from a diplomatic point of view, and this has always been difficult speaking to Syrians since 2011, having these conversations, the, the bilateral relationships or the multilateral relationships that let's say the US, the UK, the EU has with Russia and Iran are far more important than the rights of Syrians who have, who have risen up in an organic way. They weren't directed, they weren't project managed by you know, the, the, the US as, as some very unreconstructed anti-imperialists like to say. It's a, a revolution that wasn't asked for. And that's, I think that's part of the difficulty. Absolutely, I agree with uh, you. That's why I don't have much hope in diplomacy. Yeah. Because they're not looking for the same kind of things that I think the majority of the Syrian people are looking for. Before we wrap up, I know there'll be other people have questions. We, we, we could look at a lot of the negatives, a lot of the failings of the international community, and there's been massive failings. I just want you to leave the audience with some positives where you think the positives are and where they in particular uh, can engage more in I amplifying say, wait, those positives. One final th I want to say, just finish the previous thing quickly. Um, it's something that will make me unpopular amongst the kind of people that I'm already unpopular with. <laughs> um, I'm, not a, I'm not a warmonger. I'm aware I will now sound like one. Um, but in the 1930s, um, you know, when Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia and um, the Anschluss with Austria and the Rhineland and the Sudetenland, in all st stage by stage by stage, people remembered the First World War, and very rightly they didn't want another war. And um, people said, we, he has to, we have to involve him in the solution, mm -hmm. we have to talk to him, we have to do business with him because he's a player and he runs a state, so he's a rational actor, as they said at the time, because that's what it looked like. Um, and the result of that was a total world war 
The result of that was uh, a, a, if, if when he tried to, he, his general, Hitler's generals, when he told them to invade the Rhineland, um, Hitler's generals said, we're not gonna, we don't want to, they resisted. They said, we don't want to do it because the French will attack and we're not in a position to defend ourselves. And he said, if they, he said, they're not going to move, but if they do move, then I will be wrong and you will be right and you, and you retreat and come back. And nobody moved. And that's now known as appeasement. Yep. Everybody knows that appeasement was a bad idea. Now, I'm sorry, Putin. Um, you know, lefties tend to think that um, he was forced to invade the Ukraine because the European Union was expanding or something. I don't know. But, it, it, you know, there are all kinds of issues in the Ukraine. But fundamentally, um, invading the Ukraine um, was not a good idea. It was beyond not a good idea. It was a, a dramatic act of aggression in Europe. And people are not really, the right and the left, aren't really talking about it to mm. the extent of the seriousness of this problem. Um, Russia is a, a very scary, you know, it's a very scary country, a very, very scary country. In, in Syria, part of what he's doing in Syria is because he knows he wants to create problems for the European Union. And he knows that he's making a lot more people refugees. And he knows that next spring, when the weather gets warmer, that's still happening, but there's going to be thousands and thousands coming across the Mediterranean every day at the same time that he is funding extreme right-wing parties all over Europe. Now, I don't know, until what point, he's also in the Arctic. Mm. There are all these grey areas where, because it was all ice, which is now melting, um, so nobody really delineated the borders carefully. In those grey areas, Putin is now building um, big military bases with, with high-tech... Mm. Um, stuff, you know, I mean, th Putin is a, th a direct threat. I am not saying, therefore, we should go to war with Russia tomorrow, obviously. But I am saying that we should recognize this and that we should try to stop appeasing him, stop pretending that there's a peace process in Syria in which he's going to decide who's a terrorist when he's bombing hospitals in Syria and creating more refugees. You know, I mean... When he invaded the Ukraine, it really shocks me that the, uh, the, 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 the governments we have these days are worried that if we lose half a percent on our economic growth this year, they won't vote for us again and we're out. Um, what they should have done is absolutely total economic sanctions when he invaded the Ukraine. Total. I mean, on, you know, not buying any oil or gas from Russia and the rest of Europe kind of giving countries that then are, don't have enough, giving it to them. They should have agreed to do that so to avoid a bigger problem down the line. He, he is escalating, and it's not going to end nicely. You wanted me to say something I positive. I wanted you to say something positive, though, because we're, go we're getting into real doom territory here. Um, the positive thing is that, you know, I, what's happened in the last five years, certainly for me, has been a revolution too, although I've been at a safe distance from it, um, thank God my family and are safe and comfortable, but it, is, it has revolutionized all my ideas about everything. It's changed my way of looking at other human beings. It's changed my way of thinking about politics. I think a lot of my politics in the past was simplistic and I, I was much too much in, interested in these big grand narratives and big stories, which actually when you look in detail don't often work. Mm. And um, uh, 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 it's taught me a lot. It's taught me not to sh shoot my mouth off about Sri Lanka or Venezuela without really knowing what's happening there. Um, mm. <laughs> and, and, um, and the Syrian people have really inspired me. I mean, the, the uh, it, it, uh, again, we're back to the first thing, mm. optimism or pessimism. You have to veer between both. I mean, in Syria, Syrians themselves have involved themselves in the acts of the most, you know, the basest human depravity. Children have been tortured to death on a large scale. Men, women, and children have been raped on a large scale. I mean, you can't get worse than this. Human beings can't do worse than this. At the same time, as I keep saying, you know, people in the most difficult of circumstances, where you would expect them just to die or, or, or explode or, or just to blow themselves up or become terrorists or whatever. And so many people have responded in the most creative, intelligent ways that this really inspires me, and that makes me think that there is hope for the future, not in any of the states involved, but in the people themselves. Totally, 100%. Uh, fascinating discussion. Um, Thank you. You're always welcome here. Get this book. This book is very, very important for those people who want to know about what's going on in Syria. You can get it outside. It's uh, £10, usually £15. Thank you, 
uh, Pluto. There's a reception downstairs as well, so we can carry on the discussion. I'm sure, Robin, you'll sign a few copies. I'll sign uh, copies downstairs. Uh, for everybody. So thank you all for coming. Can thank you, you Robin. Down. Thank you, Pluto. <laughs> Thank you.